Good afternoon, everyone. So for the lower East Rift Zone update, Fissure 8 continues to erupt lava into the channel. That carries it to the coast. Overnight and this morning, the lava in that channel seemed sluggish, and uh, um, the, channel le the lava level in the channel was a bit lower than we've seen in recent days. At the coast, the lava flow um, remained about a tenth of a mile, or another way to look at it is 500 feet, from the Pohoiki boat ramp at Isaac Holly. The actual ocean entry was still a few hundred yards east of that flow edge. There were no other fissures active this morning. Gas emissions at the lower east roof zone remain high and, of course, contributes to the ongoing hazard associated with the bog. And we'll have the Weather Service talk more about the winds and how that's fitting in with the bog story. At the summit, the most recent collapse event was at around 6.40 a.m. on July 24th. So we're now at 53 hours, just at just maybe just over 53 hours since the last collapse event. This is the longest interval between events since May, and we do, the seismicity is picking up, so we do expect that the next collapse event will happen. The SO2 emissions at the summit remain low on the order of 100 tons per day. And I'll stop at that. Thank you, Janet. Our next speaker is Jessica Farrakane. That's F as in Frank, E-R-R-A-C-A-N-E. -E. Jessica Farrakane is the Public Affairs Officer with Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have two updates to share with you this morning, or this afternoon, sorry. Um, on Highway 11, just past the park entrance, we are down to one lane again as the Hawaii Department of Transportation assesses damage and formulates the repair plans for the damage caused by this ongoing seismic activity. Um, they're using ground penetrating radar on, on the roadway. And um, so all day today and into uh, this evening will be one lane up there. So please drive carefully. The speed limit has been dropped to 25 miles an hour in some places. The road is still passable, so that's the great news. And um, Friday, we'll be back to normal, but Monday, uh, we'll go back to the one-lane highway again um, as they continue their work. Any further questions really about Highway 11 should be directed to uh, the Hawaii Department of Transportation. Uh, the other piece of news I have is um, kind of exciting as well. The Kahuku unit, we have a very new, we have a brand new trail that we're unveiling this weekend. It's called the Paths and Trails, and we'll do our first guided hike of that. Um, the trail name is called Pali o Ka'eo. It's a two-mile, moderately difficult trail. It offers really amazing views of the Kahuku and the Ka'u uh, coastline. I hiked it myself a few weeks ago. It's gorgeous. Lots of koa and okia, old-growth um, forest to walk through. And the first guided hike will be held um, on July 28th, which is this Saturday from 930 to 1230. It's recommended that you have a high clearance vehicle to get up into the, to the uh, trailhead. That's all I have. Thank you, Jessica. Our third and final spokesperson is Robert Ballard. That's B as in boy, A-L-L-A-R-D. Robert Ballard is a meteorologist with the National Weather Service. Aloha, everyone. While we are in the time of year when we would expect to see the trade winds blowing most consistently, and that's what we have for the next several days, a uh, big area of high pressure off to the northeast of the islands is going to keep locally breezy trades blowing. So the emissions from the volcano, including Vogue and Lays, uh, would be expected to blow toward the southwest, uh, which is what we've seen most of the time uh, over the last few days with some uh, brief periods where the plume has gotten pulled more toward the west or west-northwest. Um, we are st still seeing some enhancement um, to the shower activity coming in, uh, w which has been the case uh, for the last several weeks. Um, and again, when we have areas of enhanced moisture moving through, like what we had last night over the Big Island, uh, the cumulus um, blowing up over the lower east rift zone gets taller and deposits more uh, rainfall over a very localized uh, small area, um, but areas uh, like Leilani Estates are seeing 
uh, a lot more rainfall than uh, than they would typically see in a trade wind pattern. And again, that's as I said before, that's going to continue for as long as the volcano is putting out hot lava. Um, trying to think of what else to talk about, there are uh, a couple of uh, depressions in the East Pacific, which the National Hurricane Center has just spun up. Neither of those is expected to be uh, any real threat to the Hawaiian Islands or have any impact uh, on the Lower East Rift Zone, at least not at this point, and we don't see any reason why farther out in time why that would happen either. So something we'll keep an eye on, but we're not really that concerned about it at this point. And I think that's all I have. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, <clears throat> in a moment, we will go to questions. I want to take um, advantage of this moment in case any people join the call since we started in the very beginning. And remind people that today's telephone news briefing will be the last in the series of regularly scheduled, or I should say pre-scheduled, news briefings about Kilauea activity. Um, the volcano and the volcanic activity has stabilized enough, if, if you can call an active volcano stable, that is, um, but enough so there's not breaking news every single day. You are still always welcome to contact us, any of the experts on these briefings. You can send an email to volcanomedia at usgs.gov and reach us. And of course, if anything really big does happen, we can always reschedule briefings in the future. But for now, this will be the last in the series of regularly pre-scheduled briefings. Our first question comes from Caleb Jones. Your line is open with the Associated Press. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, apologies in advance for the several questions that I'll have today, but I will uh, get back in line after the first one. Uh, Janet, uh, I've heard some anecdotal um, uh, accounts of um, a relationship between uh, a summit collapse um, explosions and uh, a surge of lava coming out of Fisher 8. Um, the, the question I have is, is, first of all, is that true? And, um, you know, kind of the second part of that question, if there were um, a blockage or a, a possible collapse of the cone around Fisher 8 and then a subsequent um, uh, collapse explosion at the summit, uh, is there a potential for a larger um, eruption uh, at Fisher 8? Hi, Caleb. This is Janet. <clears throat> I'm going to turn you over to Ingrid uh, Johansson and, and have her answer. Hi. So, yeah, I can address the, um, the first of your questions uh, regarding whether or not um, there uh, is evidence for a surge uh, in uh, lava flow out at Leilani Estates after uh, a collapse. So we, we see um, a correspondent. We've seen a correspondence on several occasions between the occurrence of a Type A and uh, an increase in uh, lava effusion rate. Uh, it, it hasn't been um, uh, fully conclusive, and so far it hasn't proved to be predictable in terms of being able to predict that there will be overflows or predict what might happen with uh, the lava channel. But we do see. Uh, some evidence for uh, an association between the two. As for your second question, I'll turn you back over to Janet. <clears throat> so, so, Caleb, the sec second part of your question was? Uh, well, uh, I guess the overarching question is, you know, as the cinder cone builds up around Fisher 8, is there a potential for a collapse there that could uh, create a blockage uh, where, there would, uh, where it would force lava to come out somewhere else? A, co a collapse? Uh, you're talking about a collapse of the cinder cone at Fissure 8. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, is, I, I don't know what you guys know about its stability or whether or not that's a possibility, um, but if it were to collapse in on itself and uh, plug off the, the flow of lava there, um, essentially what would happen? Um, right now I think that's a little difficult to answer. You know, it, it really depends on how stable that cone is. And at this point, I don't know that, that we know that. I mean, we can base this on what we observed, you know, during the growth of Pu'o'o uh, back in the in 83, the, the first three years of its growth. And so the cone is made of cinder and spatter. And so the cinder is, is uh, tephrit's loose material, and then the spatter is, is, you can kind of envision, you know, blobs of molten lava piling up on that. So the spatter kind of helps hold it together, but the, the, nevertheless, you still have cinder in there. So 
it's it's not necessarily the most stable stable feature, and so um, we do we have seen you know the cone grow higher and then some of the top parts uh, will kind of slough off. Now whether or not a wholesale collapse, if that would be enough to block the vent, uh, it's hard to say. I I I have a hard time envisioning that that even if it collapsed, it could completely plug the vent. Uh, the material would probably just be carried down uh, down the channel. I'm going to look at my colleague here, Ingrid, uh, to see because the cinder and spatter is fairly light material. Um, so, what do you think, Ingrid? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, my, my sense is that um, you know, yeah, a lot of the material making up the cinder cone is very light, so that uh, if it did fall into the fissure, it might be just reabsorbed or carried downstream rather than plugging it up. Yeah, no, I think I think there has been there has been a conversation uh, in this most recent document that if um, you know if fissure vent if it becomes more confined to a point rather than than a crack um, that that could result in uh, fountains of lava reaching higher um, reaching higher elevations. Uh, you know, it's kind of like if you can imagine a, a water hose that's full of water, and, and if you poke a hole in it, there's going to be stuff squirting out of that single hole. But if you cut a line in that hose, it's going to be leaking out over a greater area, and so it, it doesn't have the pressure built up to, to go higher into the air. So, Caleb, I don't know if that helps, but um, that's what we can offer. Uh, that was a good answer. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Nina Wu with Honolulu Star Advertiser. Your line is open. Hi there. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much. Um, I'm revisiting the whole um, question about volume again, and I think from a just from a regular person's point of view, we're just wondering just how much lava is there uh, coming out of the Summit Reservoir and how much more could there be? So I um, believe in your report you said it's coming out at a rate of 100 cubic meters per second. Uh, do scientists have an estimated volume, how much magma is at the summit reservoir? And is it possible there could be a secondary reservoir supplying the East Rift Zone? I, you know, I'm going to have to get back to you with the um, exact number for um, our, our most recent estimate for the volume coming out of the um, summit reservoir. Um, oh, okay. There's an updated volume? Okay. Well, I... I, I uh, I do need to go back and check. I'm not sure when the last time you got a volume was. Um, oh, okay. I was referring to the uh, July 15 report, which said it was estimated about 100 cubic meters per second, or there was a range <clears throat> for up to 150 cubic meters per second. Uh, Nina, you're you're asking two two different questions. Uh, you're asking one part of your question seemed to be asking the volume of the summit reservoir of magma. And then okay. the other part of your question seemed to be asking the volume of lava being erupted. The 50 to 150 cubic meters per second is the volume of lava that's moving through the channel, being erupted at fissure 8. Okay. Uh, so okay. that's the volume, and that, that's the number that we still have um, okay. at this point. Uh, as far as the volume of the summit reservoir, that's what Ingrid would like to check into and can get back to you on that. Oh, okay. So you um, maybe want to get back to me by email or something? Yes, yeah, we'll get back to you. Okay. Right. Okay. It, what about my question about if it's possible that a secondary reservoir might be feeding this? Yeah. At, so at the moment, we don't see uh, evidence for a second reservoir feeding into the eruption to... Um, to a large degree. Um, okay. Uh, it appears to still be the shallow Halimamo Reservoir. Okay. Thanks. I do have a second question, but I can wait till the next round. Our next question comes from Austin Westfall with Hawaii News Now. Your line is open. Hi. So I saw that no type A flows have been reported since Tuesday at 6 a.m., and that this is the longest interval between such events since uh, late May. I also heard you say that the lava in the channel uh, seems sluggish and the lava levels seem to be lower. And on top of this, the fountain at Fisher 8 uh, it appears to be relatively low. Um, with all that, is there any likelihood that Fisher 8 might be slowing down? Hey, Austin, this is Janet at, at uh, uh, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. That really is a million-dollar question right now. Um, we're watching this closely. Um, 
I think it all depends what we see after the next collapse event. Uh, that will, that will, I think, uh, n no one is making a prognosis or a forecast at this time until we see uh, when and the effects of the next collapse event at the summit. And now we'll go to Michael Phillips with Weather Boy Weather. Your line is open. Hi. It looks like uh, there was just a collapse event just moments ago. Hi, this is Janet. I want to just uh, uh, interrupt here for a moment. That is um, is true. We just got the word at, uh, I think it was determined at 1210. Uh, the collapse event did occur at the summit. And um, the they're still working out what the equivalent um, energy release was in terms of equivalency to an earthquake. So we will... Um, we will get that information. If it comes out while we're on the call, we'll let you know. But the, the uh, collapse event has occurred now at the, uh, at the summit. Our next question comes from Andrew Hay with Reuters. Your line is open. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the July 15th report, uh, which said uh, uh, it was most likely that the activity on the Lower East Rift Zone would continue for months or years. And with that in mind, the main hazard that you highlighted was um, a uh, failure of the cone or uh, channel walls or a blockage of the channel, which would uh, could divert most, if not all, of the lava flow in, in a new direction. And uh, I wondered, you know, given that you guys think this is going to keep going for months or years, I wondered what you, likelihood, you know, percentage or, you know, out of 10 likelihood was that uh, at some point the cone uh, would fail or a channel wall would fail and you could get that sort of uh, partial or complete diversion of the channel. Uh, Rick Hansler. Hi. Uh, um, I, have a, I have another person in here who's been in the field, and it's Rick Hazlitt. He's with the University of, of Hawaii at Hilo and also works with the USGS. Uh, he spent a lot of time out there, so I'm going to let him weigh in on this. Uh, yeah, as things uh, stand, uh, the, the general structure of the eruption seems uh, pretty stable, and what collapses have taken place have been uh, flushed down the system as large blocks that we're informally calling lava bergs uh, that uh, roll and tumble uh, down, uh, down the course, uh, well away from the vent, and those critical areas where uh, diversions might be most uh, harmful to surrounding infrastructure. So uh, we're not uh, very worried at the moment about uh, the loss of uh, facilities uh, apart from uh, the potential disappearance of the uh, landing at uh, Poweke, uh, which serves the south coast of, of the island. Uh, if this continues for a long time, we know from the example of Pu'uo'o further up the rift zone uh, that this can be maintained for many months uh, without the risk of a, of a major diversion from the uh, initial set course of the, uh, the channel. Okay, that help? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's very difficult to put a percentage on these things. Uh, we, we don't have that forecast ability to give a percentage on how likely it is or is not. Right. But, I mean, you spent quite a lot of energy in that report raising the risk of this happening and really highlighted it in the report. And uh, now you're telling me it's, it's pretty unlikely to happen. So it doesn't really jive with what that July 15th report said. I believe the point of the report was to, to uh, list the possible hazards. Um, that could that could be possible, and um, that's the reason it's listed there. Okay, it's uh, it's a non-hazardous hazard. I wouldn't necessarily say that, but we did make we did it, the purpose of the the, the paper was to uh, to uh, list the hazards, uh, the possible uh, hazards associated with the ongoing eruption, and what could be possible. Okay, thanks. The next one is Alex Schmidt with NPR. Your line is open. Thank you. 
Um, my question is, uh, based on historical records that we have, can you describe how the flow at Kilauea up to this point differs or does not differ from other eruptions in the area? Hi, Alex. This is Janet Babb with um, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Um, the, the current flow, if we compare it to the most recent flow from Pua'o, is different in, um, in a couple of ways. One is the volume that's being erupted. Uh, the volume of the current flow is, as we've stated previously on this call, is 50 to 150 cubic meters per second, whereas the 61G flow from Pua'o, which was the most recent flow from, from that eruption just prior to this event, uh, the volume output was between three and four cubic meters per second. Uh, the, other, the other difference um, is that a lot of the, the, at the particularly at the ocean entry, at, with the 61G flow, it was primarily a Pahoehoe flow that was entering the ocean where there was a very steep off offshore slope. And here we have um, more of an off flow with the current, current activity, more of an off flow that's um, entering the ocean where the offshore slope is not as steep. And so that's made some differences um, in, in the behavior at the, at the coast. And in terms of location as well, are there any records um, uh, that we know of um, with, with mass flows like this at these rates, or is it just completely different? This current flow in the lower East Rift Zone, there, there have been other lower East Rift Zone eruptions. We've talked about them extensively in past calls, 1840, 1955, 1960. Um, but this flow, the, the volume that's being erupted right now is unprecedented compared to those, those flows that I've just, um, those eruptions that I just mentioned. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Caleb Jones, Associated Press. Your line is open. Great, thanks. Um, I wish I could ask 10 more questions, but I can't. Um, so um, I'm looking at uh, those, uh, you know, the 1840, 1950, 1960 eruptions, and I'm wondering if you have any data um, about whether or not there was any kind of similar correspondence between the, the summit uh, lava activity and those lower east rift zone eruptions? Uh, Caleb, so regarding the, the summit collapse, that that is unprecedented for those comparing those, um, those um, eruptions to what's going on currently. The only thing that was um, somewhat similar was in 1924. When there was summit activity, it did not, but the thing is it didn't result in a lower east rift zone eruption. Um, they thought that maybe there was an offshore eruption you know, on the seafloor, but I don't know if there's been any evidence of that found. Mm -hmm. But there was summit, some summit collapse associated in, in 1924, but uh, 1840, 1955, 1960, um, uh, the only thing I can think of is the 1960 Lower East Drift Zone eruption was preceded by the Kilauea Iki eruption, which is uh, up at the summit of, of Kilauea, but we didn't see the kind of this wholesale collapse that we're seeing now. Actually, and Ingrid's going to make another comment. Well, I just wanted to also um, say that we have seen this connection between the summit and eruptions on the East Rift Zone before, and in particular in the 2011 uh, Komoomoa fissure eruption. Uh, that was also accompanied by quite a lot of deflation at the summit, but nothing compared, nothing compared to the amount of deflation we've seen now. So it didn't generate any collapses, but that connection between you know, the summit reservoir and lava flows um, uh, the East Drift Zone has been observed in other events. Yeah, that's that's a really good point that Ingrid made. That there is, I mean, there is. It's been known for quite a long time. There is a connection between summit activity and East Rift Zone activity. That's been sure. well documented. Okay, good. Great. Thanks, guys. And thanks everybody for uh, for making these calls available. It's been great. Our next question comes from Denise with USA Today. Your line is open. Um, uh, hi, my question had been for Janet, but it was answered. I was wondering what the magnitude was of the eruptive event, but I already got the text while I was waiting in the queue. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. It's Austin Westfall with Hawaii News Now. Your line is open. Hi, I want to know what's being done to monitor the development of the lava formation offshore. Uh, is there still danger of a collapse, and is it supported below by Earth? 
or old flows, or is it creating sort of a, a shelf uh, that could conceivably collapse and cause a, a local or larger tsunami? Uh, if this question has already been uh, asked and answered, I apologize, but I feel the public may need to be either warned or, or reassured about this. Yeah, I assume you're asking about the lava delta, is that correct? Yeah, the lava delta. Okay, so the lava delta, the hazards associated with ocean entries and lava deltas are, are well documented. Uh, we even have a page on the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory website about ocean entry hazards and this, this very subject. Um, so what what's a little different now is that the offshore topography is not as steep as it has been uh, in past ocean entries on Kilauea. And so that makes a difference on, on how that lava delta builds up as well as its stability. But at some point, as the current lava delta continues to push seaward, as it continues to build out seaward, it will eventually reach the, the edge of the shelf and then deeper water. And so it takes, once that happens, it takes longer for the, the delta to build up. <clears throat> but then it's also um, more unstable in that it's, it would be easier for it to, to break apart and to collapse. Uh, so I can't remember all the parts of your question, but... Generally hazard, speaking, the, the, the hazards are documented. We do have the information on our website uh, it, that, that could be helpful to answer your question. Thank you. And our last question comes from Nina Wu with Honolulu, Honolulu Star Advisor. Your line is open. Just wondering, what was the re reason for the, the delay in this one? Since this is the first of that delay, what could be the reason for it? And how long are these expected to occur? Yeah, so as for, you know, what the reason is, um, that's a question that we're asking ourselves. So that's, that, that's a, one of the primary things that we would like to understand about this event, and this is sort of um, unprecedented territory. One possibility is that um, we are seeing um, a, a decrease in the occurrence of these events. But I, I, I probably shouldn't even have said that because I think that's... Um, much too soon uh, to tell. So for now, th th there is some variability in um, when these, you know, how frequently these events occur, um, and this was um, outside the typical range. Um, I think we really have to look for a couple more to see if um, okay. this timing, uh, the timing continues to lengthen and activity decreases, uh, or if we end up um, as frequent as we were in the past. Okay, so we don't know how long these will are expected to occur. We don't know how long, how many, how many more there are, or how long, as long as the eruption continues. Or our assumption is, as long as lava continues to erupt on the lower East Rift Zone, that there is the likelihood of continued uh, summit collapses. And again, I think the, the the length of the interval between the last one and today's event uh, that could be an anomaly. But as Ingrid said. It's too early to say. We need to wait and watch and see how the next collapses occur and to see if the interval between collapses is indeed increasing or if this was just an anomaly. You know, we have seen it has varied from the beginning, and yes, you are correct. I believe that uh, today's is number 58. It's, some, it's, it's approaching, approaching 60, but, um, yeah, so there have been variations in the intervals between the collapse events, and so... Right now, um, we're waiting and watching to see how, how, what happens in the coming days. 